friends here today, Brother Santana, amen. I can tell you stories about him. First time I went to Sister Allie Taylor's church down at Conant in Seven Mile. Uh, the organist didn't show up in a morning service, and Santana got up there, and he started playing the drums, and everybody, everybody knew what he was playing. And so they just started singing right along. He could play the drums, and people know what he was playing. Anyway, we did, I told him we didn't need the organist the rest of the week. Hallelujah, just me and, me and Brother Santana would take care of it. Hallelujah. So I'm glad to see also uh, uh, Brother Richard and Maria Sherman here. And uh, who else is here? Uh, Brother Billings and uh, John Kish is here. Stephanie. Stephanie's older now than she was last week. Hallelujah. <laughs> She's had a birthday. Amen. Uh, matter of fact, I'm older now than I was. Amen. Have you, has that anybody else here older than you were last week? Amen. <laughs> I promise you one thing that I'm going to tell you today that is absolutely, totally true. I hope this be, it becomes a blessing to you. God's people here on earth, you and me, are extensions of God to finish the work that he began. That's our job. That's our duty. Somebody said to me recently, said, I, I wish we could go back to the New Testament church. And my question was this, which first century church do you want to go back to? Because in the book of Revelation, the second and third chapter, there's seven mentioned there. Pergamos, nobody wants to go there because that was the seat of Satan. Sometimes feel that I live there. <laughs> Amen. With the circumstances in the country today. Uh, there's another church called Ephesus, uh, which means a desirable church, or it means desirable. Uh, but other, uh, one thing that God had against it, they left their first love. You can see that happening today. Some, you want to go to the Ephesus church? They're, they're all over this country. They've left their first love. I don't know where they're going, but they're not there where they started. And then Smyrna, a persecuted church. Nobody wants to go to a church that's being persecuted, do we? I don't want to. I don't want to be persecuted. I don't want to hurt nobody, and I don't want to be hurt. Amen. Thank you, John Dillon or Bob Dillon. Amen. But it means sweet-smelling probably because that's where they made perfume at in the ancient days. Or what about the church at Theotira? And that church is seen everywhere today too. It's a church that's always repenting. You have churches that said, you do whatever you want, just repent. Has anybody heard that kind of message before? Because you can't exhaust God's grace. Amen. That's what they teach. And then there's the church at Sardis. In Sardis, uh, I, I've nicknamed that one the dying church. And you know I'm telling the truth. You've seen churches die. I have, but mine's coming back to life. Amen. The devil tried to kill me in the hospital. And he failed again. How many times has the devil tried to destroy you? And here you are. You're still living for God. And then there's the church of Sardis. It is literally the dying church. The church of Laodicea. I, I've heard people, uh, you know people go, you've gone to churches like that. It's a church of lukewarmness. They used to be hot. Hallelujah. But now they're not. La, 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 la. When you're hot, you're hot. And when you're not, you're not. They used to be, but they're not anymore. You want to go to that church? Well, many people are and think that's the normal thing to do. But I have another church in mind, and it's the Church of Philadelphia that gets a bad rap because of the brotherly love thing in there. 
Instead, we used to be known, didn't we, as the people of God that love everybody. How many can remember that? Oh, they're Christians. They love everybody. That's the Philadelphia church. I call it the loyal church, the kingdom church. Many people today don't understand these terms that I'm throwing out here, but the kingdom church is for the kingdom of God, not my kingdom, not a man's kingdom, not a denomination's kingdom, but for the kingdom of God. That's the kingdom I'm talking about. And we are loyal. I believe we are. I am a kingdom preacher. I believe in the kingdom of God. I believe that God has certain things that he wants to do. Many churches right now, according to culture, and uh, right now culture is, is so diverse. <laughs> you know, culture is the complete word for the word cult. Culture. It means a cult. Many people are cultish today. Some churches modify their forms of practices and their way of worship and their expressions of Christianity, and they think it makes them remain relevant in the society that we live in. You see them. There's church, mega churches. They're around everywhere. You go there, and you can just completely disappear. Just sit in the audience. Nobody bother you. <laughs> You can go there and listen to some good music with smoke coming out of the speakers and stuff. And then after you, you say, oh, my God, I went to church today. There are churches that try to do that in order to get people so that they will, the church will be relevant, relevant. I started to say relevant for revelation. And many people do that. You have seen entire denominations fall apart. Not just the pandemic had nothing to do it. They were falling apart a long time. I myself have watched a 50-year decline in Pentecost. You have too. You started out when I started out. You look at the Pentecostal churches today and you almost want to laugh. Well, what are they? I mean, they're not really uh, Pentecostal. But we have to pray about these things. I, I've separated the evangelical churches into five categories here. One is I call them the Bible teaching church. They claim to be based on the Bibles. They say we're teachers, not preachers, just like they were at Berea. They were Bereans. This is what we, we teach the gospel, the word of God, of God. I don't doubt that they do. Then there is the evangelistic church. They, they advertise themselves as evangelistic. They, uh, they save the lost or try to at any cost. That's all that's on their mind. No matter what it takes, they're ready to do it. Just to get people to come out to church. Uh, if, it, if it takes a rap star, they'll do it. If it takes, it takes women in bikinis, they'll do that too. They'll get anything to come out to the house of God to make the church seem like it's still important and has a place. That's in their mind. That's not in my mind, and that's not in God's mind. You can say amen if you want to. Then we have a new group that uh, recently sprung up called Charismatics. We all know exactly what that means. The Charismatics, they want to get the glory down. That's all they, and they'll do crazy stuff. Have you, has anybody ever gone to a charismatic meeting? <laughs> I have. I mean, some of them will sit there and laugh in a chair until they fall out in hysteria. And they think that's the moving of God's spirit. The laughing church. Uh, a church, uh, uh, they told me about a revival down in Florida. And, and this, this church, you know what their big thing was? They fell out in the spirit. They said, have you ever seen that? I said, almost every service. I mean, you do that. The whole world did it. <laughs> that was serving God. And then there's the prayer kind of churches. I'm going to step on toes here so you can put your feet under your seat. 
the prayer kind of church. I call it this because you go for prayer, you go for a word from the Lord, you go for a prophecy, you want to be spiritual, you want somebody, and you'll take five prophets and put them all together at the end of a month and see which parts of each prophecy you want to keep because you bought a tape <laughs> or a CD. So you listen to them. I've had, you have people, you know people like that. You're not like that, are you? You just go get a word from the Lord. Oh, well, that's not exact. That's not a complete word from the Lord. God has more to tell me. So you go to another church that is a prayer church for them to pray for you. And you think that's, that's all right. Well, there are churches who specialize in that. And then there's another church. I, I, I said there's five of them. There may be hundreds of more that are too small in categories. One is a, a, a community church, a cross-cultural church. That's what they call it, a cross-culture church. What they want to specialize in doing is helping the community. They want to give you food uh, like anybody starving in America. <laughs> They want to give you clothes. They're all old clothes. They don't take you down here to Neiman Marcus and dress you up now. There's some clothes that somebody else didn't want. And so they'll give those to you. And they, they're nice people. Nothing in the world wrong with doing that. But I'm going to tell you what Jesus said. This you ought to have done, but you shouldn't have left the other undone. All of these things I've said, that's what a church should be doing. Well, it's a word church. Well, what does that mean? It's a word church. Is there a church in the world that is not a word church? Well, what that means is they have one kind of presentation of the gospel. You go sit there with your notebooks and you get them out and you underline your Bible and you do all this and then forget it as soon as you get home. Because most of it is just a nice sermon. I categorize today's churches in four major categories. You might want to be listening to this now. Because I'm about to make a step. Amen. You know, I was listening to the mighty clouds this, uh, uh, this, uh, this morning when, before I come down here. And Joe Legon was saying, singing a song, I made a step. I made a step on it. It's time for us to make a step. Joe told me about this in a meeting we had, and Joe just said to me, he said, you've got to get a vision. <laughs> you've got to tell us what you want. I'm, I'm getting ready. This is the lead up to it. Amen. I found a direction. I found four. The one I call the Fortress Church. They are so judgmental that they have built a wall around them so they can keep themselves unspotted from the world. We don't do that. God knows if you come in here, you better dress right or we're going to throw you out. You know the world's coming to an end anyway and you ain't got your hair dressed right. God, the apocalypse is coming. And why are you wearing them open-toed shoes? <laughs> come on, say amen. You know I'm telling the truth. Amen. Woe be unto you if you got a tattoo. That kind of rhymed, didn't it? Won't be unto you if you got a tattoo. Amen. A friend of mine wrote a song. He said he had long hair so he couldn't be saved. <laughs> a rich young ruler came one day to ask the Lord the straight and narrow way. But he had long hair and he couldn't be saved. Some people, you know, we ignore that nowadays. That long hair for men is nothing. Amen. We don't even, uh, even the, the holiness preachers don't even talk about that because they all got long hair too. So, you know, some of these things seem to be cultural, not necessarily biblical. Can anybody say amen? amen. And then there's another group. I call these different. They, it's a prophetical church. And I'm not talking about, yea, I say unto thee prophecies. It's a prophetical church that everything around them is revolved around fulfilling prophecies in the Old Testament. I don't want to shock any of you, but I, 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 don't, I, I don't want you to start listening to Jesus now at this late date. 
But Jesus said the law and the prophets were until John. I don't think he's talking about John Keish. I mean, he could have been. But I think he was talking about John the baptizer. The law and the prophets were until John. After this, the kingdom, the gospel is preached. And you press your way into it. Amen. So all of these uh, uh, pretend uh, Jews out here, they're trying to be Jews, Jewish Christians, and there ain't no such thing. You're either a Jew or you're a Christian. Talking religion now. We have to understand something here. You cannot manufacture things out of the word of God because of culture. And when you start interpreting things according to what the world thinks, you have already lost your battle. And these prophetical people, God's going to kill everybody and we're going to fly off in the sky. That's their message. Apocalypse. It's coming. You say, don't you believe that? Yeah, I believe an apocalypse is coming. <laughs> I believe it's already here. <laughs> I don't know if you've been apocalyptic yet, but I, I certainly have. <laughs> I get apocalyptic at the gas station. <laughs> I, I get apocalyptic at the grocery store. <laughs> Amen. I, so, uh, uh, yeah, I, do I believe that things, yeah, things are bad? I do believe that there is not an antichrist. I believe there are many antichrists. They're all around me. Thank God for Jesus, or I wouldn't be here today. The devil had his way, you'd be dead, but God has saved you alive. And if you're alive, how many are alive here today? Amen. The Lord told me today, I saved you alive for a reason. I've been through, through the worst parts of life that are death that you can think of, both of them. I experienced them all within 30 days. And I'll tell you, God saved me through all of that, and I praise God for it every day. Because I would not be here today if it had not been for Jesus. I'd be gone. I'd be laying. You'd been at a funeral. No, probably you wouldn't even come to my funeral. But I do another kind of, uh, of church here that I want to talk to you about. And, and one, it's called, I call it the compromising church. How many people compromise on everything? They don't want to get into an argument. They're afraid that they're going to offend somebody. I want you to say, t tell you something. You don't have to be mean. You don't have to be belligerent. You don't have to, you know, yell so loud, snot and slobber and tears and everything fall out. Amen. You need to learn to state your case. And what if some believe? It doesn't change the faith of God. The Word of God says, does it make the faith of God of none effect? There are people who are never going to believe, no matter what you say to them, no matter what you give them, no matter what you provide for them, they're never going to believe. Because if you give them something, they'll be suspicious of you. Even if the Lord tells you to do that. I walk by a bum sitting over here, and I, I say that with all reverence because I've been on the bum myself. Saw a guy sitting there, and I reached in my pocket and had some change, and I gave it to him. He said, why'd you do that? I said, well, give it back. <laughs> oh, no, no, I needed it, but why'd you do that? I said, I just felt that you needed it. And then the compromising church will do anything to get, this is what they do. Uh, A. A. Allen, in his book, uh, um, um, Starving Sheep and Overfed Shepherds, he wrote this line. They spend their time counting nickels and noses. How many people, how many noses were there, how many people were there, and how much was the offering? And when you make your report out to the headquarters, the denominational headquarters, that's what you report. 
You don't report things like, we had a great move of God and people were shouting and praying. They don't want to know that. They want to know how many people were there and how big was the offering. I know I filled out those reports myself. Huh? And then here is the church I'm getting to, my vision. I want a kingdom church. Because the kingdom is not coming. The kingdom came. I know the Lord's prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. They were praying before the kingdom got here. Do you understand what Jesus actually did when he got here? It wasn't that he's just a baby in a manger that we celebrate, and we should. Amen. I don't care. It's good. Give gifts. Amuse your children. Make them happy. Ador uh, decorate a tree. It's okay with me. I'm not against uh, things like that. But what I'm trying to tell you is this, child of God. You and I have a duty to recognize what Jesus actually came for. That the world through him might be saved and not be lost. I agree with that. But all the world is not going to get saved. We know that. We know that no matter how we witness to somebody, they're going to still turn their back and go their own way. But there is something else here. That's not why Jesus came. If Jesus came to save everybody in the world, believe me, everybody in the world would be saved. But he didn't come to do that. He didn't come to save everybody, but to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. That's where we are. That's where I am. Hallelujah. I'm a son of God. I moved from here over to here. I moved into the kingdom of God. I was born into it. I'm a prince in my kingdom. I'm here in this world. I'm an ambassador sent to a far country. Hallelujah. My kingdom is above. My kingdom is more than just the one in heaven that everybody's waiting for, streets of gold and live in a mansion. That's their idea. That's not my idea. Hallelujah. I believe right now that the kingdom of God is not coming. It's already been here, and it's been here from the time, listen to it, from the time Jesus stood on top of Mount Tabor, the Mount of Transfiguration. The reason I believe that is because Peter said, we, these are, we didn't follow cunningly devised fables. But we have been eyewitnesses to the glory and the coming, the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We were eyewitnesses to it. When on that holy mountain, there appeared with him Moses and Elijah. Amen. And Peter said, Let it, and his face began to shine as the sun, and his raiment became white as the light. It was shimmering. You got two, two cases of this in Luke, the eight, ninth chapter and in, in Matthew 17, talking about the same thing. Luke 9, 28 tells you something that he stood there and his garments begin to shimmer and sparkle. I'll tell you one thing. Something happened to Jesus on top of that mountain. When he was up there, Moses and Elijah appeared with him. This is a vision, by the way. God did not raise Moses from the dead and Elijah from the dead and bring them there. Instead, Jesus told them in, in Matthew the 17, see that you tell this vision to no one. So it was a vision. But there appeared with him the vision, in the vision, Moses and Elijah. And Peter said, oh, Lord, let me, I got a revelation here. Peter said, let us build here three churches, three tabernacles. We'll build one to Moses and one to Elijah on top of this mountain. And oh, yes, Jesus, we'll build one to you. But that's not God's plan. Get over it. Amen. Get over it. If you've got other plans and other kingdoms and other kings and other prophets that you want to anoint, get over yourself because there is only one. And the Bible said, all of a sudden they were overshadowed by a cloud and a voice out of that cloud said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Stop listening to everybody else and hear him. 
Amen. And they lifted up their eyes. I'm giving you good advice. Yay, you want a prophecy? Here it is. They saw no man save Jesus only. Well, what happened to Moses and Elijah? I can tell you, I know what it is because Jesus came to fulfill Moses and came to fulfill Elijah. He was a fulfillment of the law and the prophets. So I believe metaphysically, spiritually, translucently, I don't know what you'd say it. Uh, tra the word is transfigure. So this is the way it happened. Uh, uh, you know, they, he was transfigured before them. I believe Moses stepped inside Jesus. And I believe Elijah stepped inside Jesus. So when they looked up, there was no man save Jesus only. Now you say, Brother Ross, what's that got to do to me, with me? I want something better than Moses in you. I want something better than Elijah in you. I want Jesus in you. I want you to be anointed by the Holy Ghost and that, oh hallelujah, with a mighty burning fire. I want the Spirit of God to get inside of you. That's why I'm telling you right now, we've got to change something. We've got to change something in the church, not just my church, not this, this local body here. I'm talking about the church in the world. We've got to change something. 78% of the people that were just surveyed last year, they said that the Christian church is the most judgmental group and segment of society. In other words, they're saying 78%. That's almost 80. That means only 20%. Uh, kind of think we're all right. Maybe. They haven't been here, but they think we're, well, you're probably doing a good work. Instead, child of God, 70-80% of the people in America think we're too judgmental. I don't get it. Why? Uh, well, I do understand some of it. We've been called judgmental by people who hate us. How many times is a modern saying, don't judge me? They think that's all we do. Sit around and say, oh, you see that guy? Judge him. <laughs> Amen. No, we don't do that. I don't know. I don't do that. When somebody comes to church here, I don't sit around, I wonder where they come from. Well, look at them. Look, look, look how, what, what they're wearing there. And look at their face. And look at, uh, they got, can't you see? They got too much lipstick on. My, you know, I, I was thinking, you know, if I get any paler, I'm, <laughs> amen. I'm going to get some of that man tan. Hallelujah. <laughs> amen. And people say, well, you, you, women shouldn't curl their hair. Brother, I was in a church and they asked me, do you believe women should bob their hair? I said, bob who? <laughs> you know, you know, curl their hair. And I said, if they want to. I remember, I remember this very well. And I, I was about 14 years old. I was preaching in, in southern Indiana. And when I was preaching there, this, and she was kind of homely. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, just, you know. Can I get real here? <laughs> she said, I got such ugly hair. I, my mama won't let me go to the beauty shop and get my hair fixed. I said, what do you want to do to it? She said, I want it curly and wavy and beautiful. I want to put hairspray on it. I said, well, go ahead. Oh, they, I, I got churched that night. Because they say, we don't believe in that around here. I said, well, you ain't going to keep that girl very long. Because she's going to go get her hair cut. Listen. <laughs> get your, fix yourself up. Amen. What, I mean, look as good as you can look. You're a child of the king. Amen. That's why I hated, hated to, to see people uh, practically deform themselves in order to comply. Amen. I want to tell you something, child of God. I believe in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't believe his kingdom is coming. I believe it already came. Because when he walked down the mountain, Jesus walked down the mountain and told his disciples, Peter, James, and John, who were the only ones worthy to go up the mountain with him. 
When he came down, those other disciples are trying to cast out a devil. And uh, they asked Jesus, they, they said, we tried to cast the devil. You told us how to do it. We tried to do it, and we couldn't do it. And Jesus said, this kind goeth not forth but by prayer and fasting. But the church doesn't want Yeah, Some of these churches here, those judgmental ones, want to starve you to death. You haven't fasted and prayed enough. Well, listen, there ain't nobody sitting in this building right now or probably in the city of Roseville who has fasted more than I have. Every February since A.A. A. Allen and I were in the Philippine Islands, every February the entire month since A.A. A. Allen, I went there first in 1962. Every February I fast the entire month and pray. And in addition to that, before I ever met A.A. A. Allen, before I met him, I, 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 I read, you know, Atomic Power with God through fasting and prayer. I'll save you some time. And some, some Big Macs, amen. <laughs> I fasted for four, at the age of 13, I fasted 40 days. And at the end of it, I thought I was going to get great power with God. And at the end of it, I felt the same as I did before. What up, Jesus? <laughs> Here I am. I, I, I'm, I, I'm so weak I can't hardly get out of bed. And then when the 40th day was passed, I said, I don't feel any great surge of power from God. The devil hasn't come here and tried to tempt me. The devil hasn't taken me up on a mountain. In the wilderness, nothing has happened. What, what am I doing here? This is supposed to give me power. And I promise you right then, uh, uh, nothing happened. I lost some weight. But I didn't receive any great power from God. So I understood one thing. What Jesus was talking about this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. He was talking about praying and fasting for a reason. Not to get power over the devil, but more than that. Get you ready for what God wants you to do. You and I got a long way to go in order to be what God wants us to be. I'm not what God wants me to be. Hallelujah. I'm, 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 I'm terrified when I start thinking of what could have happened to me. I'm terrified and I worry about this at night. What could have happened and didn't. And it wasn't because I had great faith. Well, you're called and you're separate and you're special. No, it wasn't because of that. I, I'm healed and standing here today because of a merciful God who has a plan for me. And I know because he has a plan for me, he has a plan for you. You're not what God has called you to be yet. You may, have, you're, you may be all right as far as you've gone, but there is more that you have to do here, church. What more can I do, Brother Ross? And I ain't talking about the offering. What I'm talking about is you. You've got to get on fire for God because my next church after the kingdom church is more than that. It's a Holy Ghost filled church. I want God's people to be Holy Ghost filled. I want you to have the power of the Holy Ghost on the inside of you, Santana. I want you to have that in you so that you'll lay hands on the sick and see them recover. You'll be healed and heal. Hallelujah. You'll be made whole and make other people whole. Hallelujah. I want you to be so rich in money. Money. Are you a prosperity preacher, Brother Ross? Oh, yes. I believe in God's prosperity. I don't believe in wasting the money, but I believe that God's going to give you more than enough. He said, I'll give you enough money to leave an inheritance to your children's children. That's great grands, isn't it? In other words, I'm telling you right now, child of God, that you and I are in a special and unique position. And before this can, any of this can happen, we have to get our minds so stayed on the Lord. Hallelujah. Christ in us will give us power to take dominion in the earth. You know what happened, don't you, and when the kings were here in Israel? They called on a prophet, and he said, hey, I need some music here. Get me some music. And he said, hey, wait a minute. 
I didn't even know that guy, that king was going to be here. If I had known that king was going to be here, I wouldn't even come. You know why this was so? It's because these prophets of God had power with God. They ain't calling me for advice now, but I tell you before I go to heaven, presidents will be calling people in this church and asking what to do. They don't know. They don't have a clue. Amen. G7 leaders, I looked at all of them over there. They all, none of them have a clue what to do. Amen. They're afraid of images and impressions they had in their mind. I'm going to tell you, they, they've na labeled Putin an enemy. Can I tell you something? He ain't no more enemy than people we got here right here in this country. Putin don't care about the United States. He got his own business to take care of. And I learned a long time ago to take care of my own business and let everybody else do the same. What my business is, is getting people on fire for God. I want you filled with the Holy Ghost. I want you so full of the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, when you go to visit somebody in the hospital, you clean out the third floor, hallelujah. Come on, say amen. Give you power with God so much you can walk through the worst part of this town with drug addicts hanging around. Somebody called me from uh, uh, San Francisco. They said, you would not believe what this city is like since you were here last. Drug addicts, pills, uh, uh, everybody robbing, uh, streets are filthy, everything else. Uh, you wouldn't want to come right now. And I said, well, God needs to send somebody there. Amen. 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 We don't want to deal with that kind of stuff. We must be the compromising church. We must be the uh, used to have it but don't have it anymore church. Hallelujah. I want to be known as if anybody's sick in this city, they can come here and get prayer for healing and be healed. Amen. Come on, say amen. And it doesn't have to be me that does it. Amen. I want to say somebody demon possessed, get out of their car out there, and before they get in here, five people attack that devil and get him out of that person, let him come in in peace. Amen. I want you so full of the Holy Ghost that if an ambulance drives out here, you'll push each other out of the way to get to pray for them. Hallelujah. Woe unto those that walk in here with a cane or a crutch. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. I won't even have to, I won't, I won't even be able to get to him because you'll be praying for him before I get there. <laughs> Binding and charging and loosening and calling forth. Hallelujah. Storm comes around here. You get up and calm the storm. Hallelujah. I want you so full of the Holy Ghost that the power of God is upon you. And when the Holy Ghost anoints you, you'll do what God tells you to do. Go where God sends you. Be what God says you can be. And have everything that God promises us we can have. Hallelujah. Because I am what God says I am. Holy men of old were moved upon by the Holy Spirit and the revelation was given to them is God's word in the Holy Scriptures. Is God speaking any less today through holy men who are called of God to bring a message through revelation to this generation? Listen, I, I, I believe in revelation messages. Amen. I believe that I, what I mean by that is not prophesying what's going to happen. I believe in a message where you read something and say, oh, my God, I never saw that before. Amen. God reveals something to you through the Scripture. It was there all the time, but you wasn't ready for it, I guess. And then when you read it that one time, when you're anointed of the Holy Ghost, then all of a sudden, hallelujah, the sky opens up. The, the sun shines through. You have what they call an epiphany. The Apostle Paul had an epiphany on the road to Damascus. Hey, man. The light broke through. That hard-headed man uh, who knew he was doing work for God, amen, in one of those judgmental churches, a fortress church that they'd built around it, and they wouldn't let any, you know, that's how God had to get rid of the temple. I mean, I don't want to get political here, but I want to tell you, God had to do away with that because God didn't want the temple to be in one spot on top of a mountain. God wanted you to be the temple. 
What? Know you not that you are the temple of God? And whoever defiles this temple, him shall God destroy? I promise you right now that God is ready and God is able to take us to a higher level. But we have to make a new commitment to God and get a hold of God. What are What is the church world waiting for? Every, every, you read everything from everybody and hear everybody preach it on TV. and every, They all are expecting something to happen. Well, we need to get this car in motion. Hallelujah. Electric or gas. Hallelujah. Or push it yourself. It don't matter. And we've got to get this vehicle vehicle roll in here. We've got to get a church that's on fire for God. A church with the spirit of God moving on the inside of it. Holy Ghost power down in your heart. That not just makes you walk right and talk right and do right. Amen. Hallelujah. That's good. And you should be doing that anyway. But I'm talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They should be operating in you. You should be speaking in tongues. Hallelujah. You should be giving messages. Who will listen to me, Brother Ross? You do, don't you? Don't you listen to yourself? If the Holy Ghost speaks through you, ain't you even going to listen to it? Come on, say amen. How many hear the Holy Ghost speaks through you? Well, if it does, when the Holy Ghost speaks, do you listen to the message that the Holy Ghost gives you? Hallelujah. <laughs> the Holy Ghost that goes through you ain't just for everybody else. It could be for you too. Amen. Well, I don't prophesy when I'm in the prayer room. When would you get in the prayer room? I, take a picture of it and, and text it to me. I want to see your prayer room. <laughs> Amen. We're not dealing in that kind of talk today. I'm telling you the truth. If you've got a prayer room, send me a picture of it. I want to see it. Everybody out there, send me a picture of it. I want to see it. you got a prayer room, send it to me. I have one up there. Uh, we had a little room up there in the, in the office. We didn't know what to do with it. I said, I'll call it a prayer room. And so <laughs> one of my friends sent me a, a prayer do. Anybody know what? That, that's a kneeler. That's where you, you have a chair and you get your knees on it and you hold your arms up like this and uh, in, my, in my prayer room. I also call it the confessional. <laughs> I don't ask people to come in there and confess. I go in there and confess. Amen. The thing is, child of God, you have to learn how to pray. Everybody, everybody that sends me a message right now, I'll send you a picture of my prayer do. It's a French word. Prayer do and where I pray at. If you'll send me one of yours. Amen. I feel the spirit of the Lord here today. I feel the spirit of the Lord. I feel the spirit of the Lord. Yeah, I'm going to give you a new revelation here today. The church, we, the church of God, must become the people that God ordained us to be in order for us. Because I tell you right now, the scripture in Hebrews, the ninth chapter says, the Lord shall not return until all of his enemies be made his footstool. Well, who's going to do that? Well, it's us. We're supposed to go forth in the power of the Holy Ghost and subdue kingdoms, Amen. overcome. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They'll be so terrified of the situation in this world, they're going to start calling on men and women of God to come and tell them what to do. Just like uh, uh, they did with Elisha and Elijah. They're going to start calling men and women of God to say, what, what shall we do? What, what shall we do in a circumstance like this? They did that in Bible days. Why don't we have prophets right now who prophesy, yea, and it's the truth when they say it and it comes out of their mouth? They don't only just foretell the future, but they call those things which are not as though they are. That's a real prophet of God. The difference between a minor prophet and a major prophet, a minor prophet just reads the Bible and tells you what's going to happen according to him. But when you get to be a major prophet with faith and power, then you speak the future into existence. Is there not a prophet here that we may inquire of the Lord? Well, yeah, there is one, but he's not much of a prophet. He just poured water on the hands of Elijah. 
And Elisha comes out there and says, Hey, I got a word from the Lord. Make some music for me. I know how to get you out of this trouble and this situation. Is there anybody that, that, that has the anointing of God to get us out of this situation that we're in? The answer is yes. God has people who have never bowed their knee to Baal. God has people who have never compromised. God has people, and they're not vicious people who are condemning and judgmental. They do it like Jesus did. We know that Jesus spent time, amen. He didn't get in the pig pen with a prodigal son. He told him to come out of there. You and I have to have this kind of power, and if we don't, then we're missing something from God. As sons of God, we must become manifested, revealed to this world. You and I have to have this kind of power. You say, Brother Ross, how is this possible? With all the people live where I live, work where I work, do all I got to do. Can I tell you something? You'll do it because it is ordained of God for you to do it. Gideon, he was out thrashing. He was a farmer, you know. The Midianites had overrun Israel, and everybody had to bow down to the Midianites. Even God's people that never bowed to anybody, they all bowed down or there went their head. Gideon was out there thrashing on a thrashing floor, and I've been to this little place there. You ought to see where it was. It was between two hills down in a little tiny valley. He was hiding so nobody would see him. And here he is thrashing his crop. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him and said this, Oh, thou mighty man of valor. I can just see Gideon now saying, Who, me? Are you talking to me? <laughs> me? I'm a farmer. No, you're a mighty man of valor when the Holy Ghost gets on you. He said, I want you to raise an army. And oh, hallelujah. What a beautiful story this is. He goes out to raise, I'm trying to raise an army, but I can't, I, listen, I got to tell you, there's, there's too many people uh, that are missing the boat when it comes to ministering for God. I don't need 30,000. I need 300. Listen to what I'm saying. You get them down there and you tell them to go get a drink of water. 30,000 men went down there and drank from us. Some of them were so thirsty, they just fell into the water and started drinking. 300 of them knelt down and cupped the water in their hand and brought it up like that. You know why they wanted to do that? Because they kept their eye on the horizon. They were looking ahead. They didn't want the enemy to catch them. He said, that's your 300 right there. Those men are called. I can use them. I'm going to fill them with bravery and power and, and give them the anointing that they need in their life. God is not looking for a whole lot, but he wants to use the ones he's got. Amen. 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 And it's you. It's you. It's me. Amen. They call me... <laughs> They, they wrote a book, and they, they wrote my name in there, well, one of God's generals. And I said, oh, no, that's not me. That, you talk, must be talking about somebody else. I'm not a general. Amen. This is that not the original book. Another one, because God keeps adding generals <laughs> according to them. I'm, I'm no general. Amen. I'm not even a lieutenant. A sergeant, I'm not even that. What's corporal? I, I'm God's corporal. Because <laughs> corporals are usually, anybody, you've been in the military, Ray. You, who does all the work? It ain't the generals. <laughs> it's the enlisted guy out there. <laughs> the, the lowest on the totem pole, he's the one doing all the work. Well, that, that must be me. Hallelujah. The lowest one in the hierarchy. I'm one that when I kneel down to get a drink, I got my eyes on the horizon. When God touches me with his spirit, I'm looking ahead. You've got to get in on getting ready to do because all power in heaven and earth has been given unto us. Amen. 
Nothing by any means shall harm you. You will tread upon serpents and scorpions. I know these, these preachers nowadays, and uh, you know the only ones that Jesus really criticized were other preachers, those holiness people who had all their rules and their dogmas and their isms and all to condemn everybody else. Those were the ones that were afraid of Jesus because Jesus criticized them. See, he wasn't a, uh, they always paint this picture, just a loving, nice guy. No, he was pretty tough. Jesus walked into the temple and chased out all the money changers. What did he do with it? With a whip. Get out my my father's house. You've tried to make it into a house of merchandise. My house of all nations shall be called a house of prayer. Amen. But talking about doing a prayer service, I, I think that's a good idea. We need to start praying more. We need to pray before the service. Amen. And if you need prayer, stick to the end of the service and they'll pray for you then. We'll start with prayer, end with prayer. Somewhere in between there, you're going to get what you need from God. Come on, say amen. We'll, any sick, we'll anoint them with oil. Prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the, wait till the word about that gets out. Amen. I had a, a man listening to me down in, in San Bernardino, California on the radio, and he called up and talked to me at the station. Bernie Swartz uh, worked for A.A. Allen, was the manager of the station, called me up when I was down there and, uh, on the phone, and, and I said, well, you know what God says in his holy book? Because he told me he was Jewish. I said, in the, he said, God has a book? I said, yeah, it's called the Bible. He said, where do I get one of these at? I said, a lot of bookstores have them. He said, I'm going to get me a Bible. I'm going to come and see you tonight. I was over there preaching at Church of Faith and Hope and Love. Amen. <laughs> a. Benson Smith's church. And uh, he came out to the meeting. He was, he was dumbfounded. I didn't know all this. How long has this been going on? I said, yeah, since Moses came down off the mountain, since Jesus came down off the mountain, since Jesus came down off the cross, since the Holy Ghost came down into the upper room, this has been going on that long. I did not know about it, but he got on fire for God. I don't know what happened to him after that. He got on TV, radio, TV, and everything else in Southern California. He didn't know much, but he had a good heart. <laughs> he believed in God. We need to get on fire for God. What do you want to do? You can do it. Whatever you want to be, you can be it. Whatever you want to have, God will give it to you if you'll only listen. The Bible, when we stand up and say we have dominion over all the earth, that's when everything is going to change. You can be given power, but you may not use that power that God has given to you. John F. Kennedy, I just read a, a, a book, one of the things that he said during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Nobody even remembers what that was. It doesn't matter now since everybody's changed every, every opinion. But when the communists were, uh, Khrushchev was putting, uh, um, deploying missiles in Cuba, 90 miles from the United States, Kennedy gave them an ultimatum and a message. You bring those missiles in there, I'm going to bomb Cuba off the face of the earth. And they turned the boats, they stopped the boats that day, turned around, went back to wherever they came from, went back to Russia. And he wrote in his notes, he said, I had the power, I was afraid to use it. I could have done that, but I didn't want to. I could have destroyed all of them. I could have destroyed Russia at the same time. But I didn't want to do it. I got news for you right now. You got to come off this, I didn't want to do it. I don't feel it's right. I don't feel led to. That ain't going to work no more. You're the child of God. The devil's not slowing down because you don't want to get involved. It's time we get involved. Join hands with somebody this morning. I'm going to pray. Amen. 
Hallelujah. Put one on there, Rick. Hallelujah. I feel led of God to pray for everybody that's watching me first. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to send your word of promise and blessing. You said you would heal us by your stripes. Now heal in the name of Jesus. You said you would give us an abundant life. Now, Lord, pay all of our bills. Get us out of debt. Get us out of trouble. Make a way. I ask you to do it in the name of Jesus. Rick, give me that, uh, is it 14 or 15? Hallelujah. You deserve the glory. Hallelujah. I'm going to bless everybody in here today. Your life can change this very moment. You're going to see a difference. You're going to feel within your body that something has happened. God is going to make a way. God is going to make a way. Amen. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, and we lift our hands in worship as we lift your